subjects that you are dealing with as individuals in your jobs, it all blends together. It's all part of the process of art and, uh, and the relationship of art, art, artistic perspectives in our life. And I'm delighted to have our city council here, and I'd like to ask, I have a proclamation I'd like to present tonight. I'd like to ask Valerie Torres French, which is the District Fine Arts Facilitator for the city of our school district. And please come down and uh, be with us. And don't be coming. Let me present this proclamation to you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for doing this. And uh, how long have you done this art? Better. This is my second year. The second year of the two. Wonderful. Right? Well, I'll tell you, I've gone every pet talk show and rodeo experience. See all these beautiful art pieces that have been produced by our students. And some of them are going to take photographs. I can't, I, I can't believe it. They were actually hand drawn. Which is wonderful. Let me present to you a proclamation, which is a reference, reference to. Youth Art Month, and our council joins with me as we proceed with recognizing something I think very special in our youth. And as they grow older, they look at they overlook it, life and, it's, and the, the difficulties and the challenges of life just a little different in this country. Whereas Youth Art Month has been observed throughout Texas and nationally since 1961. I Educational benefits to all elementary, middle, and secondary students. We're in art education, develop students' creative problem solving and critical thinking abilities, and teaches sensibility to beauty, order, and other expressive qualities. Whereas art education gives students a deeper understanding of multicultural values and beliefs, and art education reinforces and brings to life what students learn in other subjects and then how it interrelates with student learning in art production, art history, and art criticism and aesthetics. Now that I want to read by the far best of me, and as we're in the science city of Maryland, and joined with me by a fine group of city council members, I do hereby proclaim the month of March 2017 at the Youth Art Month in Maryland. And I ask all citizens for their for coming with me and supporting art teachers as they attempt to strengthen art education in the schools and communities and give support to quality school art programs to our both our children and all of you. It's a very good pleasure I gave this up my hand seal of office and decided to make a trail in Texas and and uh, join the city with five city council members. And I'll present this to you.
Our city council meeting will start at 6.30, so we have just a few minutes here as we get a little better organized. See much of him very
Ladies and gentlemen, let me open a regular meeting of the City Council of City of Pearland for March 27th, year 2017. I can't believe how fast the year is flying away on us here. If you'll please rise, we'll have an invocation tonight by Councilmember Trent Perez and Captain Fraser of our police department will lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Dear Lord, uh, bless us this evening uh, for the decisions we are making uh, as they affect so many. Um, bless our staff for the decisions they've, they've made uh, to help inform us uh, and give us the best information available. Uh, bless our, uh, our military and all those who serve our country. Uh, bless our first responders and bless all those uh, in Pearland. Amen. I want to express our appreciation for you being here tonight. It's always good to see our citizens in the audience. And uh, it's something that uh, we always like to have all of our seats filled. And uh, that's, uh, so thank you. Thank you for being a part of the program tonight. It's a, it's a relatively short one in a sense, but it seems like when they have a short agenda, well, the, uh, it takes a lot longer to get through it. So join us in process of uh, going through the work of our city government on your behalf. Moving in our agenda to the roll call, we do have all of our council members back, and um, I do have uh, a, a sense of, uh, of, of uh, having joined with uh, council member Reed that uh, he has, uh, has had some growing pains. He had his tonsils out recently, and uh, so he's going to be speaking uh, in sign language tonight, probably. So so we're going to skip through him, but uh, but he will hear, he knows he's got in good enough shape to say I when we need to when we do the roll call and take the vote. And uh, we uh, as we go through the process, we also have uh, what we also have is something called citizen comments, which will let individuals We'd like to make a few comments to the to the uh, audience, and uh, we do have some requests. If you'd like to make a comment, if you fill out one of these, and uh, we'd certainly like to hear what you have to say and what uh, what you want to share with us. So let me let me go down through these. Andrea Bell, and I believe I saw her back there. She is, and thank you for being here tonight, Andrea. Thank you, Mayor Reed. It's always good to see you. Greg Hill, want to say thank you for your service and best to you as you go and serve in a different capacity. My name is Adrian Bell, and I come before you as the chair of the Pearland Martin Luther King Celebration Committee. And I've met with Mayor Reed, and I've also met with the uh, Heidi Weiss, executive director of the Pearland Arts and Alliance. And we have put together an organization to bring to Pearland a Martin Luther King Celebration. It would consist of a parade, also a gala, and a breakfast in 2018. And we have put in the paperwork, and we're awaiting the approval to be a 5013C corporation. And so I wanted to bring it before the uh, city council to let you know about our plans. In the next few weeks, I'm going to be turning the paperwork for the permit for the uh, parade route, which we would like to have from Pearland High School, down Orla Drive, down Pearland Parkway and have the celebration at Independence Park. It will be a celebration for the family. We're gonna have vendors. We have had a lot of participation. We have some of the committee members in the audience and we have, uh, we have a huge group of people that are putting this together. So I just wanted to come before the council. I'm available to speak with you individually and answer any questions you may have regarding our plans or to meet with you collectively. But I just wanted to let you know the, the plans that we have and that the uh, information mm -hmm. is going to be submitted to the uh, Parks Department. So, okay. I Thank appreciate you. that very much, Andrea. 
Uh, Mrs. Uh, Thomas, Carthabel Bell Thomas. Yeah, there you are. Thank you for being here today. Good evening. Uh, my name is Carla Bell Thomas, and uh, I live in the Lakes of Savannah subdivision at 13810 Creek Mill. Uh, I am here today to ask council members what they can do to help us expedite and eliminate the obstacles we are facing in staffing fire station number six in our community. But first, I would like to tell you a personal story, if I may. Uh, a little before, after I moved into the subdivision in 2011, I awoke to smoke in my house, and I didn't know where it was coming from. So, of course, I called 911 and wanted the fire department to come to my home. After waiting five minutes and 10 minutes, I began to panic. So I decided to go outside and wait for the fire department. After almost 15 minutes, a Paraland fire truck arrived at my home. They found it was just a coil in my dishwasher that was smoking. But I asked them, where were you coming from? And they said, oh, we came from town center, fire station number five. I said, well, why didn't you come from the fire station that is literally two minutes from my home in the community? Well, that fire station was not staffed. So at that time, after living in the community for a couple of years, I realized that the fire station that I was passing, going from and to work, was unstaffed. And literally, most of the residents in the community do not realize that that fire station that they pass every day, which is literally two minutes in the community's backyard, is not staffed at this time and hasn't been staffed since it was built. And that's when most of the residents find out, when they have to call 911 for an emergency or for EMS or fire issue. But our residents on our average are waiting 15 to 20 minutes for a fire truck to come to our community for an EMS or a fire emergency. When a house catches on fire in our community, they literally burn to the ground because they're waiting the 15 to 20 minutes for a fire truck to arrive to put out the fire. Three homes have been completely destroyed in our community in 2013, 2014, and 2016. Two homes have been completely destroyed prior to 2013, and we have the addresses on file for those homes. The response time could be shortened to a mere minutes if that fire station in number six was staffed. I am one of the directors on the MUD board, and we have been actively working with your chief, Riley, and the, his recruiting staff <coughs> to get that fire station staffed for over a year, but we haven't been very successful. There are several obstacles that have prevented potential volunteers in staffing that fire station. One of them is that the time commitment for volunteers. It's li literally impossible for them to volunteer because of the time commitment set by the city of Paramount if they have a full-time job. Another obstacle is that if someone were to volunteer at in the city of Paraland, they would have to volunteer at other fire stations in the community, and they could not exclusively volunteer at our fire station in our community. The city of Paraland has a moral obligation to protect the safety and welfare of the residents in the ETJs. We pray that, that we do not have loss of life because of this. We're lucky we haven't so far. I asked city council to work with the residents of Lakes of Savannah to come up with an effective plan to staff firehouse number six. And I thank you for your service and for your consideration. Good. I appreciate those comments. Thank you. Appreciate you, Ms. Thomas. Um, Renee Medlock. Medlock? Oh, yes. Thank you for being here tonight. Good evening, Mayor. And 
council members. I am Renee Medlock and I reside at 14106 Spring Knoll Lane, also in Lake Savannah community. I like Ms. Bell Thomas am here tonight to appeal to the city council, likewise to come up with a plan for us as we are ET, ETJ to Pearland. <laughs> I did attend the city council meeting a couple weeks ago where the plan was presented for the, that the consultant presented for the fire and EMS. At that meeting, um, I was a bit, a bit taken aback because some of the city council members appeared to think of the ETJ as non-important, of little significance. But we are a rather large community. We have on the side that is complete 1,600 homes. The other side that's being completed, at the end of that completion, we'll be looking at about 3,500, 3,600 homes. So it's not a rural, a rural area that we're talking about, but there are homes, there are families, and just as the lives within the city of Pearland matter, our lives in Lakes of Savannah matter as well. And I would just like to appeal for some sort of collective plan, whether that be we need to look at how we can renovate that fire station in order to have it be capable of being fully manned. Whatever option we can come up with collectively, we're open. We just want to be able to sit at the table and have the conversation and find a viable solution so that, like Ms. Bell Thomas said, houses, property are not lost, and heaven forbid, people's lives are not going to be lost as a result of the time that it takes for EMS or fire to arrive at our, at our residence. So that is my plea to the city council tonight, and I thank you for your time. Mm, I appreciate your comments. Very good. Thank you. Appreciate it. FT, FT Jones. I saw him. Hey, thank, thank you for being here. How you doing, Mayor Reed? Good. Thank you. My name is FJ Jones. I, too, live in Lakes of Savannah Subdivision. I also sit on the MUD board for MUD 21, which is Lakes of Savannah Subdivision. But I come to you today on a more personal note. On July 13th of 2016, my life changed. I walked into my living room after an evening of serving my community on the HOA board to my husband having a seizure. <coughs> my husband is 44 years old. He's the epitome of health. He owns a karate school. At that time, I didn't know it was a seizure. It looked a lot like a stroke. I contacted 911 once. I contacted 911 twice. And after 30 minutes, two paramedics showed up at my home. In between that time, I made two phone calls, one to a friend of mine, and I put a plea on my community Facebook page for some medical personnel to show up at my house to assist me and my husband. Eventually, EMS did arrive. They were very polite. And by that time, my husband had come up out of what we now know was a seizure. In 30 minutes, if he was having a stroke, he'd have been dead. I come before this board today for the lives of the community. We are already out there with very little to deal with, and we understand that. But we really want this council to consider that there are people. When I saw the map, the map looks like that fire station six is an outlier. It looks like nothing is out there. We're out there. We depend on you to save our lives. Not only do the residents of Lakes of Savannah depend on you, there are two schools out there that depend on you. Don Jeter Elementary and Savannah Lakes Elementary. If it takes 30 minutes to get to my house to save my husband, God forbid something happens at one of those schools and a child becomes a casualty of Pearland Fire Department. So, I just want to say that if you can find it in your heart to come to the table with not the mud, not the HOA, 
but the people of Lakes of Savannah. And please help us because we are out there. We've had three homes burned down. The last home, it took 22 minutes. A block can burn down in 22 minutes. We are scared. And you are the governmental entity that we are looking to for answers. So would you please find some compassion in your heart to put a viable solution on the table. And we're not saying we have a problem, you fix it. We're saying, tell us how to help us. Because since that time, we have come together as in a community and created a list of medical personnel so that no one has to wait 30 minutes before somebody comes to their home. So I want to say thank you so much for allowing me to address this community and also to allow, allow me to address this committee and council on behalf of Lakes of Savannah. Not just behalf, on behalf of the MUD board or the HOA, but on behalf of the possible 3,000 families that you have in just that neighborhood. Thank you. And I appreciate that, Ms. Jones. Thank you so much. John Coley's. And thank you for being here tonight. Appreciate you. My pleasure. My name is John Cacolese. Um I'm also a resident of Lakes of Savannah. And uh, as a former military officer, uh, I, I kind of, I, I greatly respect you, Chief. Um, I know what you're up, to, I'm up against. And I, I saw the survey that um, came out and was published in February. And so I, I asked the chief, chief, I said, Chief, if a bag of money fell out of the sky and you could do anything with it for the fire department in Fairland, what would, you know, how long would it take to, to man and staff Fire Station 6? He said, roughly two years. Okay, great. So what's the stopgap? How do we fix that? And so I propose to you, uh, Councilman, that perhaps I, I've walked the community, I've knocked on doors, and I've talked to at least a dozen firemen who live in our community who say, wow, great. I love fighting fires. I'm sure the chief can attest to this. Firefighters don't fight fires to get rich. They do it because they love the job. They love helping people. And they're all about serving the community, but they, they can't run a full-time job, come back, work a part-time job in order to work another part-time job at Fire Station 6. What they ask is, hey, what, what's the least we can do so that we can qualify ourselves to just go get a truck? and bring it to the station. We're not saying let us be entry personnel. We're not saying let us get on the ladder and fight the fire. What can I do to help my community? I can go to six, I can get the trucks, and I can get it to the fire so when Pearland 5 does show up, they have more assets to work with. And especially if those guys are already trained firefighters, they're already EMS or, or first responders certified, they can save lives on the grass in the front lawn in the meantime while these guys are, are getting there. because. It's just going to take 20 minutes to get to our neighborhood based on where five is. And so I ask that maybe there's an opportunity. I know the requirement right now is three 12 hour shifts in Pearland, somewhere in Pearland, in order to volunteer, be a, become a volunteer firefighter. Is it possible? And I ask you, Council, is it possible to give Chief Riley the latitude to make a decision? Hey, this guy's already a firefighter. He's an active firefighter somewhere. So he knows the drill. I'm former military. You can plug me in any military unit, I can function. Can we make that guy some sort of uh, first responder capability? Maybe not, maybe not a full-fledged firefighter with Pearland. I get that. How about a first responder where he can get the assets to the to the place they're needed in the in the correct amount of response time? So I ask you, Council, would you would you please give him the latitude to consider a plan like that so that I can go back to the firefighters I know and say, hey guys, would you play ball with at least this? And if we had a plan something of that nature, then then we could come up with a stopgap for at least the next two years, and that would help. Councilman, I appreciate your time. Thank you, Mayor. I appreciate those comments, sir. Thank you very much. <coughs> Frank Shearer. Thank you for being here tonight. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Can you hear me? Um, I have to admit, public speaking is not my finest strong suit, and I'm really nervous in front of all of you. So, uh, I'm also a resident of Lakes of Savannah. I've been there for about eight years. Of the three houses that burned down, I watched one of them burn from my front yard. And I come to you to share my fears. I'm, my wife's eight months pregnant with our first child. It's a high-risk pregnancy. And right now, I'm sitting here 
there is a medical <clears throat> issue, 20 to 30 minutes to respond, I can get to the hospital in 15 minutes if I'm home. But like many of you, you all have day jobs. You spend 40, 50, 60 hours a week away from your house. Do you want to live with that fear every day? Once my, you know, once our child is hopefully born without any issues, now we've got a young child to deal with in the house with emergency response time, what it is. I don't know the solution. I would love to help if you tell me what we need to do. Thank you for your time. I appreciate those comments, so thank you so much. Did anyone else want to make a comment that uh, was not aware of the, of the procedures that we have? And perhaps you, yes? Yeah. Okay, moving. into our agenda here at um, item five on, uh, I have the same agenda that you have uh, and on item five it says consent agenda are there any items to be removed from the consent agenda which consists of items a through i yes mayor huh? i'd like to remove items e f and h g f and h e g e and h no. E, F, and H, okay. You can't talk and I can't hear. Okay, with that information on the record, is there any other items from the council? <coughs> Moving to item number, uh, the consent agenda, council member Carbone, would you present this for our consideration? Thank you, Mayor. Consideration possible action approval of consent agenda items A through I, excluding E, F, and H. So moved. Second. Second. We have a motion and a second. We're in discussion. Any items that uh, we need discussion on? If not, uh, Mr. Smith, Secretary, we do have a motion. Second. Councilmember Carbone? Aye. Councilmember Reed? Aye. Councilmember Moore? Aye. Councilmember Ordno? Aye. Councilmember Hill? Aye. Councilmember Perez? Aye. Consent agenda A through I, with the exception of E, F, and H, was approved six to zero. Okay, moving to new consent agenda number E. Would you present that for consideration, Councilmember Cobo? Yep, thank you, Mayor. Consideration possible action approval of resolution R 2017-60. A resolution renewing a unit supply bid for the purchase of office supplies, so moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. We're in discussion. Staff report. Yes, sir. This is uh, a renewal as noted, <laughs> and uh, as you'd expect, the city has need of various uh, office supplies, um, so we're able to buy off of this. Um, <coughs> so we have a little bit more uniformity and, and insurance on uh, getting the best uh, product for the city. Okay. Council, have any question or comment on this item? Councilman Cavone. Thank you, Mayor. And looking at the, I guess the attachment where it goes through and picks out 120 different items, I didn't go through every one of them, um, but just looking at the first few, it, it looks like the the vendor that we've selected is actually the highest, the highest bidder on these products. Was there some sort of tabulation behind the scenes showing what, I guess, what we use in quantities to determine how to award the contract? John or anybody ever seen? Oh, Bob's out. So. And lines, line one and two, they're both, uh, I mean, we're awarding it to somebody charging us 20 bucks when there's a uh, Office Depot charges four. So that's 500% more. My recollection on this item, and we'll have to verify uh, unless Julie has some additional information, but when the total, all the items were added up together, they ended up being the low bidder last year when we awarded this. But you're right, what you see here doesn't doesn't uh, show you that information. So, Julie's got maybe got something for okay. us. Hi. Yes, in regards to all of the items, when you look at them in the totality, the Staples NJPA contract is 
more beneficial to the city. Okay. So based off of maybe the estimated quantities we're going to use, right. Staples ends up being the low bid? That's correct. Okay. I, I know, and sometimes when we get these, there's there's a calculation that's included showing all that broken out, how we can get to that bottom line. So maybe in the future, um, if it's not too big of a problem, I'd like to see that just in the... the that's definitely something yeah. we can do. All right, thank no you. Good. Any other comments from council? Hearing none, we do have a motion second on the floor, Mr. Secretary. Councilmember Carbone? Aye. Councilmember Reed? Aye. Councilmember Moore? Aye. Councilmember Ordino? Aye. Councilmember Hill? Aye. Councilmember Perez? Aye. Resolution 2017 60 passed with a 6 0 vote. Councilmember Carbone, would you present item F for our consideration? Thank you, Mayor. Consideration possible action resolution R 2017 67. Resolution authorizing uh, the city manager to enter into a lease agreement for the amount of 133000 for a modular, modular building. So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. We're in discussion. Staff report. Yes, sir. Um, as we described in a Thursday packet a couple weeks ago uh, with the office, constructions and deconstructions going on, uh, we looked at a lot of different options for relocation of uh, our engineering, excuse me, and projects group. Um, trying to balance, you know, the uh, physical location, uh, trying to keep them as much intact together, uh, functioning. It is an extended time, as you can see there, it could be up to uh, 30 months. So hopefully this is a, a worst case scenario. I'll pay a, a monthly lease, but I uh, want to present this. And uh, uh, this would entail, like you see at school buildings, uh, getting some mod this modular building over there at uh, Hill House. Uh, where we've got facilities centrally located so that uh, projects and engineering could uh, work out there to the, for the duration. You also have any question or comment on that item? Council Member Carbone. Thank you, Mayor. I, I pulled this because this is an unbudgeted item, and I don't know, I, I felt like I didn't want it to just slide by under the consent agenda. Um, it, it shows an expenditure required of 133000 with zero budget for seventeen and some potentially being budgeted in 18 upon approval. Um, can you tell us where the funds are coming from this year? Um, so for this year, I assume we uh, just charge us to uh, uh, take it out of fund balance. Uh, but as you said, you know, we frankly just probably didn't look ahead as far to see this element and this piece, knowing how all these things are coming together. Uh, we will uh, obviously budget it for the future years, but we would have roughly you know, four months, do you think, this fiscal year? So it shouldn't be a huge hit for this budget year. Yes, sir, this budget year, it's the actual setup and then the uh, approximate four months. So this this year, uh, about $42,000. Okay. And is there any other unbudgeted expenses that we're going to be seeing, be seeing in these projects? I mean, we'll keep just going going to the general fund and grabbing. I mean, at some point we'll run out. I mean, I, know, I hear the question, but, you know, it's kind of asking us what we don't know right now. I mean, that we're, uh, we don't know anything else at this time for any of these projects, I, I guess, that I can think of. Do you? If we're talking about the, the building projects and the relocations between here and Hill House or uh, here in the Orange Street project, we don't have any knowns at this point. <laughs> there is, uh, you know, the other item that you'd answer about H coming up, that was something else that uh, uh, we saw the need as we've gotten into the year here. We're trying to um, declutter and get rid of some more paper. So we've asked for this uh, 100000 on H. Um, that also was something that's come up during the year. But in the scale of things and our fund balances you'll hear about when we get to the uh, CAFR, um, you know, we've definitely got uh, um, adequate funds to cover these. And I don't know about any other council, but I, I guess in the future, if, if we're expending funds, we don't have budget. <laughs> I'd like that to be just placed on the regular agenda for new business, not thrown on a consent agenda. But I, I could be wrong. Mm -hmm. Well, what's the process for that? I, I can explain briefly. Our practice is, is that any item that's uh, less than uh, 
$300,000 we put on the consent agenda. Any item, uh, if the funds are available, any item that's over that goes on the regular agenda. So uh, what you'll typically see is, like I said, anything under that goes on consent. That's been our practice since I've been here. So how can we change that practice if the council wanted to? Council directs us to do so, and we'll be glad to do that. All right. I could be wrong, but I think in the uh, council rules and some of the agenda things, it does. I thought it set that out, but so we could bring that back, and you could modify it if you wanted to. Okay, maybe, maybe at least a discussion so other council can weigh in on it. Okay. Any other question from council on this item? Hearing none, we do have a motion second on the floor, Mr. Secretary. Councilmember Carbone? Aye. Councilmember Reed? Aye. Councilmember Moore? Aye. Councilmember Ordno? Aye. Councilmember Hill? Aye. Councilmember Perez? Aye. Resolution 2017 67 passed to the 6 0 vote. Okay. Let's move down to item H, and uh, Councilmember Carbone, would you present this for our consideration? Thank you, Mayor. Consideration possible action resolution R-2017-57, a resolution awarding unit price contract for document management services and an amount not to exceed $100,000. So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. And there any questions? Staff report. Just sir. As alluded to, uh, we have been going through the last six months uh, redoubling our efforts to uh, declutter some of the paper and so forth. We've had staff uh, as available um, going through and scanning documents and digitizing that. So uh, we've got a better system for accessing those uh, for ourselves and for the public. And uh, you know, also just trying to uh, limit the footprint so we have uh, just files. Uh, we've reached really a point where if we're gonna be effective and make a dent in this, uh, we need to hire some outside help. Um, we'd ask the consideration for this 100,000 that would uh, uh, put a big dent as described in the memo in that um, so that the departments could have some uh, additional services to do that and as mentioned uh, some that's come up during the year but uh, you know as we've gone through we'd like like to move forward on this okay. Councilor, a question comment on his comments yep thank you mayor uh, same comment hundred thousand dollar expenditure zero budgeted and it's on the consent agenda uh, we've, we've hashed that out I guess a, a more detailed question uh, it, it goes through the, the agenda write-up goes through and, and shows what all we're scanning. I guess a, a question specifically, like for timesheets, there's 120 boxes that we're gonna scan. What's our, our, our statutory requirement to keep those and would it, have we looked at the, the cost of storing those until the statute runs and then just shredding them? Or is there truly a need to, to go through 120 boxes and have them digitized? I'll make an initial comment to Cynthia if she wanted to come up and add to that. We have looked at all of our needs with all the departments here in this building and the building next door. Some of those items will be stored. Uh, some items will be stored until their retention record. Um, we can get rid of those, but the items that we're talking about digitizing here are those things that we need to keep permanently <coughs> or for an extended period of time. What is the time for timesheets? What we got to keep those? Thank you, Council. I believe the statutory requirement is seven years on timesheets. We have so many of them because they come from across the whole organization, and so we're digitizing and scanning those so that we don't have to store them on site in case an audit comes up. And I guess we've looked into the cost of storing them off site. Yes, sir, we are storing numerous items off-site as well. Any documents that are not permanent records, with the exception of the timesheets, are being stored off-site, and we're only keeping one year of those items. And as they uh, expire, then we'll destroy them so that we don't have to pay to have them scanned. Okay. All right, thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Council, have any other questions or comments at this point? Uh, just a couple, Mayor. Does this include construction plan sets for... Uh, all our public plans, all our plats. Um, would we also consider, um, maybe not necessarily as part of this, but in the future, uh, <clears throat> digitizing or requiring 
uh, to get digitized copies of the private construction plans so we can keep those on record. I know that's kind of been an issue in the past. Uh, yes, sir. This is going to include all of the large uh, volume, all of the big maps and everything that planning has. Quite a bit of this $100,000 budget is going to go to the planning and permits department to make sure that all of their items are scanned. And as you know, most of their items are permanent records. And so we will be taking care of those. As a matter of fact, I believe those are the, are the priority right now. And just to follow up on that, we do require all construction plans to be uh, submitted to the county for our projects as well as uh, development projects. Are we storing those after um, after the approvals issued? Are we keeping uh, hard them? Hard copies? No, digital copies. Yes. <clears throat> How long are we keeping them? Or are we planning to keep those? I know uh, that's a new I, project. I believe our stuff has to be con uh, kept permanently any infrastructure, public infrastructure that we keep in the county. So the private construction plans. Private construction plans, I don't know what the name of that is. Okay. Uh, Council, have another further question or comment? Oh, we have Gerada. All right. Yes, um, so um, the plats. Um, a lot of the plats are digitized. It's um, for the permit plans. Uh, we are only looking at things that have to be kept permanently. Um, the other things have been destroyed already or scanned in house. Um, moving forward with the trackage system, we don't anticipate that we will have any paper copies of anything because the whole system is electronic now. So, hmm. so would there? Would there be a benefit of keeping, I'm just suggesting, would there be a benefit now that we're going more to a digital, a digital pro program, we're getting digital copies of the plans. Uh, I think there would be a benefit to keeping the digital copies of the private plans at least for some time. I know that some of the issues that we've had coordinating one development that's going up against another is not having good construction plans that they can see what was done um, for maybe utilities, um, some of the, uh, the miscellaneous things that they may may need or want to connect to. So you're talking about the construction drawings then? Yeah, so mm -hmm. like Kroger's going in and somebody wants to build a pad site in Kroger but has no connectivity to Kroger and wants to find out where the utilities are. Um, would so there be a benefit in that? We, we are um, saving all the permit plans and site plans for individual projects. So those would have all the on-site uh, infrastructure too. So. That, that is one of the reasons. Some of our projects also span a number of years, uh, especially things like PDs where construction plans are approved for in phases and we do have to coordinate. So, yeah. Thank you. Any other comment from Council? Hearing none, we do have a motion second on the floor, Mr. Secretary. No. Councilmember Reed. Aye. Councilmember Moore. Aye. Councilmember Ordno. Aye. Councilmember Hill. Aye. Councilmember Perez. Aye. Resolution 2017-57 was approved five to one. All of you would join me in item number six, which is new business. New business item one, Councilmember Moore, would you present this for our consideration? Thank you, Mayor. Consideration possible action resolution R2017-51, so moved. We have a motion and a second. We're in discussion. Staff with you. Thanks, sir. Um, I'll introduce our uh, Assistant <coughs> Finance Director, Rick Overgaard. Uh, Rick and his team are the ones that actually prepare uh, the documents that uh, are subject of discussion. Um, they work uh, throughout the year, over the last four or five months since the close of the fiscal year, to uh, develop the financial reports and make sure that they're all square. Um, we also have outside auditors that come in and review their work and, and their processes and so forth. But I'll uh, hats off really to, to our finance team for again giving us um, you know the, the work product so we can have this important financial guideline. So. Uh, Mayor, Council, City Manager, uh, state statute requires that we have an annual audit by an independent auditor. Uh, also, a financial statement is prepared and an auditor's opinion. Uh, these all must be filed within 180 days of the fiscal year end. Uh, the audit this year was conducted by Whitley Penn. 
and we reviewed the uh, results of the audit on February 20th with the audit committee. Um, we were given an unmodified or clean audit opinion, which is great. Um, Lupe Garcia, uh, our the audit partner on the audits here, and he's going to go present the uh, highlights of the PowerPoint that we went over during the audit committee meeting. And here's here's Lupe. Good evening, mayors, members of city council, city manager. It's my pleasure to be here tonight to present to you the results of the city's fiscal year 2016 uh, financial statement audit. Uh, I prepared a, a brief presentation to take you through the process and what the results of the audit are. Uh, members of the engagement team included myself, uh, Christopher Bro, Selena Miller was the concurring partner in the field on site. We had uh, Lauren Nelson as the senior, and we had Christopher Meek and Izzy Wynn as staff. Um, our approach to the audit and the objective of the audit is we're per performing procedures to try to determine whether we, what type of opinion we can give the set of financial statements. To do that, we perform a variety of procedures. Uh, there's different phases to the audit. We started uh, last summer uh, performing internal control and compliance procedures. Then we re return in the late fall, uh, and around the month of November, to perform year-end procedures. Uh, now that the city had been, uh, the fiscal year was over and the city had time to close uh, its general ledger. Um, we do consider internal controls. That's essentially the city's policies and procedures in various areas that impact the audit that are significant to the financial statements. Um, and based on our understanding of internal control, our test of internal control, we design the nature, timing, and extent of our um, procedures. Ultimately, the financial statements are the responsibility of management. We do assist with the preparation of the comprehensive annual financial report, but we're merely taking the information that's provided by the city and, and helping uh, put into the format of a comprehensive annual financial report, but the information comes from management and they take 100% responsibility for that information. Um, various types of procedures we perform include analytical procedures, test of controls, we perform substantive procedures on various uh, account balances. Uh, that includes um, observations, viewing uh, source documents, confirming information with third parties, and of <coughs> course meeting with several individuals throughout the city face-to-face, uh, -face, having interviews, asking them questions, and asking them to provide us with documentation. Areas that are significant to the audit are listed on this slide. Uh, it's the big amounts that are going to be on the financial statements, your cash, <laughs> investments, capital assets, uh, various revenue streams. Um, a lot of uh, long-term debt information that's presented and disclosed in the report that requires um, a lot of audit procedures, many audit procedures. Um, our testing, we always perform internal control testing over payroll because it is a significant portion of the city's budget, uh, like most organizations, so we want to make sure that the controls are in place and operating effectively as designed. We also perform uh, internal control testing over the city's payments to its various vendors for, for supplies, contracted services, and other items. Um, we also perform compliance testing in the purchasing procurement area to make sure the city's following state law and federal uh, regulations were required if there's a federal program involved. Uh, the city does utilize <coughs> procurement cards, um, al although it's very difficult to have a material uh, type of error or misstatement regarding procurement cards. We always include it as part of our testing just because of the nature of, it's very easy to abuse that particular form of payment, so we want to make sure the city is uh, keeping a close uh, handle on things in regards to employees that have procurement cards. Um, this year we tested utility billing and collections, that includes residential and commercial accounts. We randomly selected various accounts throughout the fiscal year. We recalculated the bill, made sure it was uh, calculated in accordance with the city council approved rates, and that the payment was deposited and recorded in the city's accounts uh, timely. Uh, we also made sure the city was in compliance with the Public Funds Investment Act, prepared the quarterly reports, made sure investment officers were receiving the required training, making sure city council had reviewed the uh, investment policy at least annually. Um, so we're happy to report we didn't have any um, findings in this area. Uh, beginning on this slide, there are some required communications we, are, uh, we have to make to city council. Um, one is that we did review the city's accounting policies. They are in line with industry standards, and the city is following uh, the standards uh, that are uh, put, put, put out by the governmental accounting standards boards. There were a couple of pronouncements that were implemented this fiscal year, uh, relatively minor compared to prior years. They only affected the city's note disclosures related to fair value measurements and the city's use of external investment pools. 
Um, there are estimates included in the financial statements. Those include uh, the allowance for doubtful accounts, uh, estimated lives of the city's capital assets, how long are buildings, vehicles, pieces of equipment going to, use, to last. That's going to impact depreciation expense. And then that third bullet is going to be the largest estimate in the financial statements, and that has to do with the city's participation in the uh, TMRS, uh, the Municipal mm -hmm. Retirement System, um, the pension system that all the employees are, are part of. Um, TMRS has actuaries at, at the state level that review the information for the city's plan, and they provide a report every year with uh, these estimates. And so we take that report, the city takes that report, and makes the necessary entries in the general ledger to record um, all the various aspects of of that pension plan, namely that, that pension liability. Uh, we didn't identify any misstatements in our audit procedures. That's definitely good news. Uh, we didn't have any disagreements with management when it came to the application of any accounting principles, any estimates. Um, as far as we know, uh, the city uh, is not um, consulting with other accountants re regarding the opinion or any estimates or any new pronouncements. Um, you know, we do make ourselves available to the city throughout the fiscal year for questions, for things that come up during the year a as they're happening, but in no way do we believe us providing any guidance uh, or information that the, during that time is the reason why we're retained as the city's external auditors. Um, we didn't have any difficulties in, in getting information from the city. Uh, the city was a complete open book. Anything we asked for, they provided in a timely manner, <laughs> so we appreciate that. Um, as far as any written communications between us and the city, uh, the engagement letter started this entire process that was approved by city council last year. And then the last piece of information we get from the city is a management representation letter that stated the same date as the re report, as the CAFR. And it, and it states that the city is taking responsibility for the financial statements, that they haven't withheld any information that would materially affect the financial statements. There isn't any litigation, any contingencies, anything out there that should be recorded in the financial statements. And then lastly, I confirm that we're independent in regards to the city of Pearland, so we can serve as the city's external auditors. Beginning on the slide, we'll go through sections of the report uh, quickly. On page one is our report on the financial statements. That was, as was mentioned earlier, we are issuing an unmodified or clean opinion on the financial statements. So anyone that's going to look at the city's report is going to be looking for that unmodified opinion that includes yourselves, management, uh, members of, of the city of Pearland, um, and when the city uploads this report for continuing disclosure requirements, uh, credit rating agencies will be looking at this uh, report, at this document, uh, making sure an unmodified opinion is in that, um, in our report to make sure they can rely on the information. Um, on state, on page 19 of the report is the statement of net position. This is essentially the city's balance sheet on a full accrual basis of accounting very similar to what you would find in the private sector. It records all of the city's assets and all of the city's uh, debt. So that includes capital assets and uh, the city's long-term debt uh, bonds that are due over the next uh, 20, 30 years. Um, so total assets as of the end of the fiscal year uh, totaled uh, $1.3 billion. You can see the largest part of that amount are going to be your fixed assets, land, buildings, infrastructure, pieces of equipment, vehicles. Um, you have total liabilities of $668 million. Uh, the largest part of, of that amount is going to come from your long-term debt, $645 million. So overall net position, which is the difference between your assets and your liabilities and your deferred inflows and outflows, is $720 million at the end of the fiscal year 2016. If we kind of <laughs> drill down on that long-term debt number, because that is a big number on the balance sheet, these are the various components of that. You see you have various forms of long-term debt, certificates of obligation, revenue bonds, general obligation <laughs> bonds, um, revenue bonds, water and sewer revenue bonds. Um, you have the net pension liability amount here of $23.5 million. You see that increase from the previous year, um, $16.6 million. Um, this is an amount that comes from uh, TMRS. This is part of what the actuaries do is calculate this, this figure. Um, this is an amount that will change year to year based on uh, what the makeup of the city's pop employees are, are like, how the stock market does. TMRS holds investments and trust on behalf of the city. Uh, all the information in the report is as of December 31st, 2015 for, for TMRS because they have a different fiscal year. So if you can think back to 2015, it wasn't that great of a year in uh, the stock market, so investments did take a little bit of a dip. So, <laughs> in, you know, there's an uh, inverse relationship, so the liability had to increase. Um, that's a number that we'll keep an eye on, and as um, years go by, we'll have more and more data. We can start looking at trends. 
Um, so overall, total long-term debt for the city amounted to $645 million at the end of the fiscal year. We look at the general fund, which is the city's main operating account on a modified accrual basis of accounting. Uh, fund balance um, started uh, with $21.3 million. Uh, we had um, total revenues of $67 million, total expenditures of $71 million, um, other sources of $3.4 million. Uh, coming that's mainly transfers from other funds. So you had a, a decrease in fund balance during fiscal year 2016 of 434,000. So ending fund balance in the year uh, fiscal year 16 was 20.9 million. Um, looking at the various sources of revenue for the general fund, you can see property tax and sales tax makes up over half of the general fund's revenue. You have charges for services is another 22%, followed by franchise fees, license for permits, and fines and forfeitures. The city's water and sewer fund, which is its largest enterprise fund, um, started the year with $212 million in net position. This is, uh, this is on a full accrual basis of accounting, so that amount includes all the fixed assets that it takes to run the water and sewer activity. Um, the change in net position, or what was added to net position, uh, as it relate, after you factor in all the revenues and expenses of, during the year, uh, net position actually grew by 3.8 million, so it, net position at the end of the fiscal year was 216 million. In addition to an audit of the financial statements, because the city does receive and expend <coughs> federal and state uh, grant funds, there's a special audit uh, referred to as a single audit that we have to also do. We have to identify major programs that we test to make sure the city's in compliance with the uh, grant agreement. Those major programs included uh, Metro Mobility Grants for Bailey Road and McCard Road, and then a Coastal Impact Assistance Program. This was a, a program that was a pass-through from Brazoria County. Um, we didn't have any deficiencies in internal control that we noted over financial reporting or compliance. Uh, we didn't note any question costs or non-compliance over these programs. So we are going to issue an unmodified opinion uh, over compliance on these major um, program requirements. Uh, that's important, especially for the federal single audit, because at the end of the audit, we will submit within 30 days um, uh, something to the federal audit clearinghouse. It's a, a federal a database, so federal agencies that, uh, will look there first to see how the city did in its financial statement and single audit to see whether or not um, they need to take any further uh, action as far as their risk assessment and their monitoring procedures of the city. So good news with an unmodified opinion on compliance. Um, here were the next steps, uh, today's council meeting. Um, the city has submitted uh, its comprehensive annual financial report to um, the Government Finance Officers Association for the last, I believe, 39 years. So the city goes above and beyond and prepares a more robust, comprehensive report that includes a lot more information for users to be able to, to read and use in the an analysis of the city. Um, it's received uh, the award every year for the last 39 years. So they're going to submit this report and uh, hopefully uh, receive the award again for fiscal year 2016. And then the submission of the Federal Audit Clearinghouse report that will happen within 30 days, um, that will be uh, the next steps. So if there are any questions on the audit process, our report on the Comprehensive Annual Financial Report, or either one of the single audits, I'll be happy to take those at this time. Mm -hmm. I'd like to ask you, uh, what would you, how would you characterize the fiscal health of Pearland? When we look at fiscal health, you know, our opinion is, is the information correct as stated? Uh, one of the things we look at is, is the city within its uh, fund balance requirements, its reserves, and so it is within its policy of, of what it requires to have an unassigned fund balance, so it is uh, an adequate <coughs> reserve. It is financially what we would refer to as being a fiscally healthy run organization city. Good. I appreciate that. For the... Uh uh, those of you in the audience, we have we do have an audit committee made up of the mayor, two council members, the city manager and the finance director, and other senior staff members. And uh, we went over this particular budget in, in detail, and uh, we had a, uh, a number of questions that uh, came up. A lot of it was uh, learning questions sometimes. But uh, we felt that uh, we're... For a city that's growing as fast as we are, and the fact that we started out with practically no tax base back in the old days, and we've been building, <laughs> trying to build to play catch up, and uh, which I hope continues for a while, and we're catching up with our debt service. But uh, we're making good progress in that respect, and uh, so I, uh, I think that 
uh, we, we've kept a pretty tight eye on this thing, and we do have a, uh, some good people with good numbers, uh, know the numbers pretty well on our council, so thank you. Open it up to council comments. Anybody else have a comment or question on this item? Councilman Garbone, did you have any uh, wrap-up comments? <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, we, we saw the report and the, a little more detailed presentation of the audit committee, and I uh, want to thank uh, Lupe and the staff for another another year of, of decent audit. So thank you all. Good. Being no further questions, uh, we do have a motion second on the floor, Mr. Secretary. Council Member Moore? Aye. Council Member Ordno? Aye. Council Member Hill? Aye. Council Member Perez? Aye. Council Member Carbone? Aye. Council Member Reed? Aye. Resolution 2017-51 was approved the 6 to 0. Okay. <clears throat> Moving in our agenda, item number two, Council Member Ordno, would you present this for consideration? Consideration of possible action, second and final reading of ordinance number 2000-T-24, so moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. We're in discussion. Uh, staff report. Thanks, sir. Um, this item has been discussed in a number of different ways and uh, forums, uh, but so this comes to the second and final reading. Um, does reflect the council's uh, discussions and actions uh, at the first reading. Uh, modifies our land use matrix for what requires a conditional use and uh, uh, permit, which uh, um, be, which would be beyond the, the permitted uses by right, and uh, so this is for your final consideration tonight. Okay. Council, have any questions or comments on this item? We, this was a result of a discussion in the planning and zoning in this workshop. Hearing no questions, uh, we do have a motion second on the floor, Mr. Secretary. Council Member Ordno? No. Councilmember Hill? Aye. Councilmember Perez? Aye. Councilmember Carbone? No. Councilmember Reed? Aye. Councilmember Moore? Aye. Resolution uh, Ordinance Number 22, t Ordinance Number 2000 T24 was approved 4 to 2. Okay. Moving to item number three, Councilmember Hill, would you do the honor? Thank you, Mayor. Consideration of possible action resolution number R2017-64. So moved. Second. We do have a motion and a second. We're in discussion. Uh, staff report. Thanks, sir. Um, as part of the uh, major Bailey Road improvements that uh, uh, if you've been down there recently, you can see uh, that definitely coming to take shape. We'll be able to move traffic over shortly. Uh, part of that project is also to uh, expand and strengthen the city's uh, fiber uh, connectivity. Um, it uh, does uh, primarily provide for the um, traffic signals that uh, those are all integrated and uh, that'll start to you know bear fruit for traffic uh, management uh, over time. Uh, we also use that for connecting our city facilities so the uh, rec center would be able to be uh, hooked up and um, other facilities and, and needs of the city such as the SCADA system with the water and sewer uh, relies on that. So fiber is definitely the um, <laughs> Uh, way the medium that uh, the city and other private and public agencies use that uh, reliable and, and fast and so uh, I recommend this investment here. Okay. Council, I have a question or comment on this item. Uh, just play, I think it, uh, it's becoming quite an impressive roadway. And I think it's, uh, I think it's really, really, I like the lighting and I think it's the proper Construction for, for using the using the uh, the roadway, I think, is going to be very helpful, and I think we're, we're spending it mostly through the rest of the roadways in our city at the present time, aren't we? Yes, yes, and uh, and you'll see the the walls have been installed for a good portion of that, so you can see that coming too, and really helps to find the whole corridor. It makes a big difference. It's really beginning to show. Council, have any questions or comment on something? Council Moore. Yes, I do. Um, are we going to have those break-ins on the the uh, Esplanades there, the 650 feet and 350 feet. Oh, the yeah, the, the medians. So you the can yeah. openings. Yeah. Um, the me I mean, what's, what's out there is basically where the median openings are going to be, and that was uh, 
vetted through the public uh, pu public comment process as well as meeting okay. with many with residents and businesses. Councilmember Carbone, do you have a question? I don't think. Any other question or comment? We do have a motion second on the floor, Mr. Secretary. Councilmember Hill. Aye. Councilmember Perez. Aye. Councilmember Carbone. Aye. Councilmember Reed. Aye. Councilmember Moore. Aye. Councilmember Ordino. Aye. Resolution 2017-64 was approved six to zero. Good. Moving to item four, Councilmember Perez, would you do the honor? Thank you, Mayor. Uh, resolution or uh, consideration possible action resolution number 2017-59 resolution of city council city Pearland awarding construction services contract to the Tom Reed library expansion project to construction <laughs> masters of Houston in the amount of three million three hundred nineteen thousand two hundred dollars so move second a motion second we're in discussion thank you mayor did, did you want to do your the comment I think there's some comments in this you want to them to go first, you want us to do ours? I had those set back in the back. That is item four. Sorry, so installed. Oh, no, totally up to you. Previous, you however you want to handle it. Previous item three, I didn't, didn't turn the page to item four. And we do have. Uh, and hidden behind item four divider, we do have a couple of comments. I'd have caught them later, though. Uh, Kevin Murphy, thank you for being here tonight. Good evening, gentlemen. I'm Kevin Murphy. I'm Vice President General Counsel of Triad Retail Construction. I'm asking you to consider this uh, bid process. We were a bidder on this process. And in reviewing the paperwork, we're objecting to the uh, to the scoring process. The staff memo states that it, our application, that our bid is missing a majority of the required information requested. The re as a result of that, we were scored lower than anyone else, and we feel unfairly excluded because the information that they're claiming was missed is within the packet. <clears throat> it is a. Um, and an email was circulated. The resumes of the project team company experience were not properly considered. Uh, Triad project manager who would be managing this project if we were awarded it has extensive public works experience, including building Dawson High School here in Pearland. Um, Pearland is a Pearland, uh, Triad is a Pearland business founded right here in Pearland, Texas in 2008. We employ numerous local uh, local people, Pearland residents, and people from the Pearland area, and uh, grown from a small team to over 75 employees working, uh, working on projects from Puerto Rico to Hawaii and spreading the name of Pearland in all of those places. We're licensed to work in all but three states that require a contractor license, currently working on projects across the country. Local projects include the $6 million public storage over on Broadway, numerous retail, restaurants, <coughs> office projects in the Pearland <coughs> Town Center, including the Convention and Visitors Bureau office at the Pearland Town Center. In 2016, Triad was awarded $62 million in construction contracts by our clients. We'd respectfully ask that you review this. Our, our bid is $54,000 lower than the bid that is being proposed tonight for approval. And uh, I would ask you to consider whether any, admit, any omissions are worth $54,000 of taxpayer money. Um, thank you. Appreciate those comments. Thank you very much, uh, Kevin. Uh, Tony Darcy, thank you for being here tonight. Mr. Mayor, Council, my name is Jay Dorsey. I am the owner of Triad Construction. I'm also a Pearland resident. Um, I would ask Council to table this issue and do some further research on staff's vetting of this bid. Um, I do not believe the scoring was <coughs> proper or relevant. I believe that aspects of the scoring were not reviewed properly. 
Um, I certainly take exception to the statement that the majority of the documents were not filled out properly or not turned in. I think if you look at the bid package, you will find that the items that were not there were immaterial or were in fact present in other areas of the bid form. One of the items that was referenced as not being turned in was the local option, 3% option, which only applies if the contract is less than $100,000. This project is well in excess of 100,000, so that would not even apply to this project if it were turned in. I, as a taxpayer, have an issue with an additional, 50, I believe it's $54,500 approximately being paid for no material gain. I believe both Construction Masters and Triad are equally qualified companies to build this project. You have a competitive bid process Low bid is supposed to be what matters. The question before you, is this bid worth paying approximately 55,000 additional dollars in taxpayers' money? What is the city going to gain from that that is not being gotten if Triad were awarded this project? Um, I hold licenses in every state in the U.S. that requires a license. I have over 1,000 remodel projects in my background. Um, so I think we're immensely qualified to do this project. So I would ask you to table this and investigate the vetting process of this bid a little more thoroughly. Mm. Thank you for your time. Good. I appreciate those comments. Thank you, sir, very much. Moving to staff report. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, uh, stepping back uh, first, uh, this is a 2007 um, bond issue project is identified. Uh, getting near the end of those, uh, we've worked through the a lot, majority of the mobility projects uh, and uh, pleased that we're able to present to the community uh, expansion uh, portion of this, about 8,000 square feet on the uh, Tom Reed Library across the street here. Uh, heavily used, always one of the top uh, libraries in terms of usage in the Brazoria County system. The city provides the facilities um, and the grounds and then Brazoria County staffs these and uh, provides some other services. Uh, so this is really uh, adding on to uh, what's offered there and then there's a lot of uh, building wide, facility wide improvements including HVAC. Uh, we've completed a roof already on the, pro on the buildings, so uh, just trying to take care of what we have and uh, expand it where there's uh, great public uh, interest. Um, I'll ask Mr. Epperson to talk a little about it. This is actually a uh, competitive sealed proposals uh, tender, and that's how it's put out, and everybody um, responded to that, and uh, Trent can amplify upon that and some of the relevant things and, and why this recommendation comes about to you. And, and yes, just to clarify, this is not a, a low bid um, process. It is a competitive sealed process, which is the process we've used on vertical construction, all of our buildings that we've done here in the city since approximately 2008. Uh, we've used it uh, more recently on some of our uh, public works process, uh, public works projects as well, uh, once that process was available for those projects. Um, what that process does is basically evaluates what is the best value proposal for the city um, according to a published criteria and the weights of those criteria. That criteria has to be published as part of the solicitation um, so that all firms um, see what those are and what they're going to be weighted on. Um, they actually agree to that process and, and, and the weightings uh, when they submit their uh, proposals. Um, typically what that includes, and specifically on this project, it included price, schedule, Reputation of the contractor, experience, uh, the personnel proposed, uh, the project approach, uh, subcontractors, as well as safety record. Um, of course, for the integrity of the process and to be fair to all proposers, um, the firms are evaluated on the information submitted at the time of the deadline. Um, our recommendation is to award to the highest scoring firm through that process, Construction Masters. Um, there were basically two cost proposals um, below that one. Uh, the lowest one was their overall proposal was deemed non-responsive because they qualified um, part of their proposal, which is basically they said, here's our price, but here's some qualifications where we're, we don't intend to follow or our price does not follow 
your uh, plans and specifications as were, as were uh, solicited. Um, so that was deemed non-responsive. Um, and then another firm that had a slightly lower cost proposal, um, they submitted a schedule of 16 months as part of the schedule evaluation where the solicitation required a schedule of 12 months or less. Um, and that's where the largest uh, difference in the proposals came in, um, as well as some minor differences in some other areas. Um, this project, it's important to minimize the disruption to the library, as well as any closure time for that library, and that's why um, <coughs> the schedule was 18% of the evaluation here. Um, and with that, I'd be happy to answer any additional questions. Mr. Mayor, I'll just add, uh, Construction Masters is also doing the uh, renovation underway at the City Hall complex and uh, performing well to date on that. Um, so that, you know, the criteria that was provided out, uh, that's what the scoring is. And we did provide a supplemental uh, memo. We did not receive the, the uh, comments from the other firm directly, but uh, re uh, heard about those and were able to respond to that. I think we've uh, answered all those as best we can. <clears throat> Construction Masters is a local contracting firm as well. That's worth putting. But on, as was noted, this is there's not a local preference option on uh, a large contract as this. So you, it's helpful, but it doesn't figure in the scoring. We can't. In fact, when it's low bid, you, you're not allowed to uh, have local preference on those. Read your staff report. Okay, good. Council, have any question or comment at this point? Council Member Carbone? I guess just to clarify the, the last comment by the city manager, you said when it's low bid, we can't take in the local op option? If it's if it's uh, low bid and more than $100,000, that's my understanding. Correct me if I'm wrong, it, Trent or Darren? This is a, a sealed proposal. Right. I'm just saying you you couldn't on, on a low bid one if you wanted to. But. Yes, sir. Absolutely. So in this scoring that we publish, can we not publish some, something that um, some way to factor in local option? Uh, under the competitive seal proposal, we may be able to do that, but I think we'd have to do some additional looking into the statutes, uh, the statute for competitive seal proposal, whether or not local um, or location I, I believe those those are uh, their statutory criteria, and I don't believe that's one of the criteria that you can use. So we can't. Mm -hmm. Councilman Reed saying that Houston does it all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, I, it's probably not necessarily for this. This we don't have time to talk about it right now, but I think, um, the, I think down the line there's the a way. Are, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I was just going to say the $100,000 exception is specific to construction contracts. Mm -hmm. So I don't believe that applies to other supply contracts or uh, other types of contracts um, that are not construction. That is correct. You can't consider local preference if it's a $100,000 contract that's more than $100,000 on a construction contract. And that's statutory? Yes. That is uh, uh, the government code, not the local government code. As soon as they're both local, it's kind of a mute point for, for this one. Now, if it's something we want to look at in the future, I'd be more than happy to look at it. Yeah, I know the, the city of Houston uses preference on um, qualified, uh, qualified uh, proposals, RFQs, uh, historically underutilized um, local businesses, minority owned, uh, but those are qualifications, not, not price competitive. And, and part of the hub, part of historically underutilized businesses is local. That's how Houston gets through it, though. But I mean, that's another conversation that's for right. another day. So um, anyways. There is a, I believe, I don't know if it's in our purchasing policy or another resolution that was adopted several years ago that does provide some guidance for the purchasing department on local preference. And uh, so, of course, this type of construction was excluded from that because of the value of it. If they're both local, though, I don't know what difference really it makes. So. But, I, you know, yeah, I don't. Yeah, down the line, yeah. What, what, one thing I was going to say, and I didn't mean to jump you in, okay, is just that um, it's, a, it's a tough deal because Triad has been a great vendor, but at the same time, um, I, I agree with staff's points in that 
the 12 month max, when I had read that initially, that was kind of the deal breaker for me. I mean, you got um, the proposal where construction masters also local scored 92 out of 100 and offered to complete it in the 12 months as required. And, you know, if, if you're going to, if you're not able to complete the project within the required allotted uh, time, um, to go four months over for a library, that's, that's kind of tough. So um, that coupled with the fact that looking at the, the details of the subs, it looks like construction masters, again, being local, is further using several local subs in Legio Electric, Allied Fire, Cherry Demo, et cetera. So um, I think they're both local, and um, it's just, you know, it seems like uh, given that it's a best value bid, um, it, I, I don't have an issue with it. Um, I, I want to thank staff for getting the two bids to us so, so that we could review them. I asked them to do that as soon as we received the email Friday, and they got that to us today. So um, I've reviewed the bids. I'll, I'll be honest. I've looked at the scoring. I don't have a problem with the way staff scored it. Um, Any other questions? Just look at, just, when I first looked at it, for me also, it was the the time period, the the 16 months versus the 12 months in the uh, proposed um, time frame. So I, I was I was a little concerned with um, you know having to have the library shut down for that long or you know put in disarray. So um, that's kind of the, was the deal breaker for me too. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. yeah, Carbone, you know how to wrap up. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I appreciate the, the staff's putting together the memo. I guess that, that raised a, a bigger question for me is, is looking at the agenda packet, it, it specifically says that there was a bidder that was missing a majority of the required information, resulting in a score of a 74. But um, looking at the memo, it goes through and it addresses some items and says that, hey, it might not have been in there, but it didn't affect the score. So I guess it seems like one memo saying it was missing info, that's why a low score then kind of the update shows, yeah, there might have been some missing stuff, but that didn't even factor into the score. Well, as I mentioned, the uh, email, uh, to be honest, the uh, release of that uh, came out before we fully vetted that around, and so we had to scramble a little bit to polish that up and, and get what we would have put in originally uh, with this. So that what was sent out was uh, not what we had uh, intended for the full package, but since it's on the agenda, I wanted to get that out, get the um, entirety of the scoring and the background to you, and that's what that is. So does it make sense? I mean, staff wasn't prepared for, for this to even be on the agenda, and I think there's questions here. Does it make sense to table it? From our perspective, we've, we've given that information now, but totally you've, up to council. Given it, you've given it to us, but not to the public, like you wanted to include it in the agenda? Like I said, we've got we've given that to you. If you want to, it's up to you what you're comfortable with. So. But you, what you provided today, you meant to have in the agenda packet, correct? Correct. That'd be fair, right? I don't know that we would have provided all of this response because some of it was, was specific to right. the bid protest, which I think some of those are some of the items which were brought up that were not part of the scoring criteria, the part of the memo that was provided today that does discuss the. Um, the scoring criteria, um, that's where, you know, we point out that there were some items um, not included, so the reflective score was lower. Okay. I guess I go to, to the memo. It says the purpose for moving the item to, to, to April 10th agenda uh, was to get some additional detail information included in the agenda request and the AR had not been reviewed or approved for tonight's agenda. So to me, I read that as there was additional info that staff originally wanted the us and the public to see, and right now we've seen it, but the public hadn't had a chance to review that agenda request. Is that, am I wrong in saying that? I wouldn't argue with the statement. I don't know what difference it would make, to be honest. Um, for me, it's not going to change the, the way I feel about it. And if we want to table it for a week, 
And I don't know I whether it would or wouldn't, but, but just in the, the effort of trying to keep everything out for the public to see it, I, I think that would that would only make sense. Mm -hmm. so, and I, with that being said, I'll make a motion that we postpone this till the April 10th agenda. Second. Your motion was what now? Repeat it. To postpone this vote till the April 10th agenda. Okay. As it originally intended. Yes, sir. The motion seconded. Any other discussion from the council? Yeah, so we're we're postponing it a week just so this response can be included in the agenda packet for yep. public purview. Yep. Okay. Mr. Secretary, we do have a motion second to adjourn, to move it to the next, uh, in fact, I can adjourn right now, but uh, we move it to the next uh, regular meeting, which is April the 10th. Adjourn, <laughs> I like to adjourn part, but that's okay. We'll, we'll, we'll hang around here a bit. And, Council, uh, member, yeah. Council Member Perez? No. Council Member Carbone? Aye. Council Member Reed? Aye. Council Member Moore? Aye. Councilmember Ordno? No. Councilmember Hill? Aye. Resolution 2017 59 is postponed by a vote of four to two. Okay. We have an amended motion on the table now. Any discussion on the amended motion? Any further? It's not an amended motion, it's postponed. That is not an amended motion. You, you make that amended, okay? So now we'll move to the next agenda. Good. Okay. Any last comments from staff at this point? Okay. That information on the record, let's move to item five, which would let uh, Councilmember Carbone present this for our consideration. Did you, did you want to do it? That's fine, either way. I think uh, our city attorney would like to speak, so I'll let him uh, get this right. Uh, is the, it's working. Uh, as council has learned from the last couple of council meetings, uh, this is a, an a item that would authorize a, the uh, staff to proceed with an imminent domain proceeding. And pursuant to state law, the entire caption has to be read and it's quite lengthy. And so uh, as we have with previous meetings, I'll go ahead and uh, read this motion into the record and then have the council move from there. This is resolution R2017-66. A resolution of the City Council, City of Pearland, authorizing the power of eminent domain to acquire fee simple title to certain property for the Hughes Ranch Road Improvement Project, being a 0 0.0345 of one acre, 1,504 square feet, parcel of land located in the HTMBRR Company Survey, abstract number 310, Brazoria County, Texas, being situated in lot B of the partial amending plat of Hickory Place, a subdivision per plat or map record. Uh, recorded in volume 22, pages 145, 146 of the Brazori County map records. Said 0 0.0345 acre parcel being out of and part of a 0 0.9445 of one acre residue of tract described as 0 0.9723 of one acre and a conveyance to Carl Eldridge recorded under Brazori County Clerk's file number 200505374 for the construction and maintenance of water and sewer and drainage improvements on certain real property described herein, authorizing the city attorney or his designee and other city officials to take such actions as are necessary to acquire said property located within the city by donation, purchase, or by the exercise of power of eminent domain. So moved. Second. Right. We have a motion on the floor? Do we have a second? Yes, we, we, we have did. a second. We have a second. We'll motion second. We're in discussion and uh, Staff report. Uh, Mayor, just so you'll know, this is also uh, like some of our previous cases that we've had at earlier council mm -hmm. meetings. Uh, this is the Hughes Ranch Road project. Uh, the good news is that we've actually reached an agreement with this property owner. Uh, there is a IRS tax lien on this property that needs to be uh, resolved, and we've had a difficult time getting the IRS to provide us the documentation so that we could resolve the matter and so that we could have clear title. Just received confirmation today that we uh, that the IRS is willing to provide that documentation, but we just don't have it yet. So, in all likelihood, this case is going to get resolved, and this case will never be filed. And even if we do have to file it, it's only it's what we call a friendly condemnation. Again, it's where the city and the property owner agree on the value, 
this is uh, really, uh, the only hold up here is the, uh, the IRS lien that needs to res be resolved so we can have clear title to the property. Mm -hmm. This if you have a, any other questions, I'd be happy to answer those. This is a rather unusual circumstance where the, in acquiring the property, the owner would like to sell it, but the, but the feds have, uh, uh, have not agreed at this point and, and confirmed it, so it's, uh, and we need to move forward. Yes, sir. And what do, what do you call that, a, what kind of a, a, a taking is called a what? Uh, eminent domain. I know you know, but there's another name for not when it's, Acquisition, oh, a, a but, friendly but, condemnation. Yeah, but but it's sort of a one of uh, not convenience, but one of I think there's another word. Oh, uh, there's a there's a word that goes with it when it. I can't remember what it is right now. Okay. But what it is it's it, everybody agrees except that, that we've got to do it because of. Uh, Oh, okay. I see what you're saying. Uh, I apologize that I don't have a better word to describe it. But no, that's I, all right. I understand that's what right. you're saying. No, no problem. Well, Council, I have any question or comment on the process at this point? Hearing none, we do have a motion and a second on the floor. And uh, Mr. Secretary, we better for head count. Councilmember Carbone. Aye. Councilmember Reed. Aye. Councilmember Moore. Aye. Councilmember Ordino. Aye. Councilmember Hill? Aye. Councilmember Perez? Aye. Resolution 2017-66 is approved 6 to 0. Okay, well that conclude, concludes all of the business section, but let's move to item number 7, which is mayor and councilman issues for future council agendas. Are there any items that you'd like? Yes, Mayor. Um, I'd like to add to a future item, uh, the next available council meeting, uh, opportunity to discuss how we handle unbudgeted items. And, and I would like an agenda item um, for the uh, people that were here for Savannah Lakes to discuss uh, fire and EMS services in the ETJ of Savannah Lakes. Okay. Any other item? Here is none. Let's then move to other business, which provides an opportunity for an executive session under Texas, uh, Texas Government Code Section 551.072 for real property regarding the sale, lease, purchase, or exchange of real property for the city facilities, and also for Section 551.087 regarding economic development negotiations. Obviously, in the executive session, we could discuss these issues with our staff and other relevant uh, individuals, but we cannot make a decision in executive session. But upon return to open session, we do have new business item, uh, uh, items one and two that we can consider upon return. So this time we will recess into executive session at uh, my clock says 7.59.
Council had returned from executive session at 8.59. And moving in our agenda to section one, real property regarding the sale first lease for the real property. City Attorney. Uh, Yeah, okay, no action items on that one over there, the one, okay. Moving, that being the, both, both section one, uh, item, uh, item one and item two under the exact session. And, and new business continued, there is none. Moving to item eight, which permits me to adjourn this docket public hearing and the council chamber meeting at nine o'clock.